Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be talking about Triton's atmosphere uh, using stellar occultations since uh, 1989 when Voyager uh, did its flyby. And I'll just talk a bit about Triton. Um, so Triton is the largest of Neptune's satellites uh, with a radius of 1,353 kilometers. It's the only satellite in the solar system besides Titan to possess a significant atmosphere. And its atmosphere is mainly composed of molecular nitrogen in vapor pressure equilibrium with the molecular nitrogen frost at the surface. Uh, Voyager uh, provided a surface pressure of 14 microbars uh, in 1989, and that's consistent with a vapor pressure equilibrium uh, with the surface at around 40 Kelvin. Uh, it is also a potential ocean world, and it's the subject, along with its planet, of a proposed uh, NASA mission called Trident. Um, but so other than this, why is it important to study it, and in particular its atmosphere, which is what we're doing? Uh, um, Triton is currently coming out of its extreme solstice uh, of 2000, uh, where latitudes of up to 50 degrees south were directly and constantly illuminated by the sun. And that only occurs about every 650 years because of a combination of Neptune's heliocentric motion and Triton's orbital precession. So this is the best time to do observations on Triton. In order to answer the question of it, whether its atmospheric pressure changed during the extreme solstice. So I have a zoom here of, the, of this current extreme solstice. Uh, the last observation, the one that I'll be focusing on mostly, uh, is close to Voyager 2's uh, flyby uh, of 89. And also here, I show other Earth-based uh, observations. All are occultations to be consistent with the method. And uh, to know if it changed or not, uh, we needed to have an occultation campaign with the perfect conditions. And that's where this prediction comes in. Uh, we have a bright star so that smaller telescopes can observe. Uh, it was over a densely populated area, so mainly Europe and Northern Africa. Uh, and this would allow for the biggest number of chords. And it was on the fifth on the 5th of October of 2017. And um, we also, this is pre DR2 catalog, but the Gaia mission provided a pre preliminary release of uh, the DR2 catalog with over 400 stars in Triton's field of view for the weeks that preceded the event. And it allowed to improve the, the astrometry and it gave this final prediction. So we did a call for observations with this prediction and uh, we had 90 positive observations reported, including three from the US. Um, the uh, Gaia improved the prediction a lot. The, the white lines here are the predicted path and the blue lines are the effective path. So they came very close to each other. And Guy also made a, pr a press release with, the, with these observations. Um, and so just to explain the, the plot here. So the, this black line is centrality. The big black dot is uh, the closest approach of the shadow center to the geocenter, and then the smaller black dots are spaced with one minute with each other. Um, so the event went from here to that side. This is the direction of motion. 
and the different colored dots are all the stations. The blue, st um, the blue dots are stations with successful observations and they were used in the fit. Red is successful observation but wasn't used in the fit. And white is the stations that attempted observations but were clouded out or had technical difficulties. So I show you here a closer look of the central flash path and the lines uh, around the center uh, correspond to 50 kilometers, which are about 2.5 milli arc seconds uh, projected into the sky plane. And I'm going to show you the light curve that we obtained here that is very close to centrality and it's the best signal to noise ratio of the, the three that we got that were the closest ones. So, and I'm just gonna let it play. Uh, and I'll just say that the central flash that we that we got from the from all the 25 stations, uh, they give information about the deepest layers of Triton's atmosphere. And in this case, it says that it's spherical or very close to spherical. And I'll talk a bit more about this light curve later. Um, so here we have the occultation cords for all of the positive stations. Uh, it spans Triton almost top to bottom. Uh, it covers both winter and summer hemispheres. And the colors are reversed here. The red lines are the, the ones that we used in the fit and the blue are the ones not used in the fit. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to summarize uh, the, uh, our assumptions. So there's three main assumptions. The atmosphere is composed of pure molecular nitrogen. Uh, methane, the second most abundant um, molecule, has a mixing ratio with molecular nitrog nitrogen that is less than 10 to the minus 3. And that's neg negligible for refractive occupations. So the next one is that the atmosphere is transparent. Uh, the deepest layers uh, ground-based occultations can reach are up to an altitude of about eight kilometers. So we may not see uh, hazes or clouds. And the final assumption is that the upper atmosphere is globally spherical. And that's supported by the observed central flashes and we'll talk about that later, that they are consistent with the spherical shape. And to talk a bit about the methodology here, just a summary of what's to come. Um, we use the bootstrap methods uh, without considering the central flashes. So we removed all the central flashes to retrieve the molecular density, pressure and temperature profiles. Uh, we do this using first enable in a bell inversion uh, and that gives the density profiles and then we can derive the pressure and the temperature profiles using hydrostatic and ideal gas loss uh, then we do we use a direct approach and by that we just mean that we take the resulting profiles and smooth and param parametrize them according to physical arguments. And then finally, we use uh, ray tracing to generate a synthetic light curve. Uh, and that's fitted to all the occultation light curves. And one product, one product of this is the location of Triton Center that is used iteratively, hence the bootstrap, with the Abel inversion in order to improve the accuracy of the altitude scale. And then the other method we use is the central flash fitting. So in this, we include the central flashes and we use that to measure if there's a departure from a spherical shape in the deep atmosphere. And it can also be used to constrain the wind regime and or reveal possible absorbing material, just like hazes or clouds. 
So I'll start with the Abel inversion. And we use these two light curves to do the Abel inversion. Uh, we use these two uh, in particular because they are the ones, they are the best in terms of signal to noise ratio. They are from very big um, telescopes. Uh, and they have good calibration images, uh, meaning that we can get a good uh, baseline for the for Triton's intruding flux in the light curves. Uh, and they are, they're also far from centrality. They are very southern. So one is from La Palma. The other one is from Elmos in Greece. And that means that the light curves are mostly determined by the primary image. We don't have a secondary image intruding that could uh, be dam not damaging. Um, it could enter the Abel inversion. So just to say that the, the black dots are the data, the blue is the synthetic model that has already been fitted here. And the green dots are residuals. And, and then just to, for the confirmation of the shape of the, of the profiles, we use this light curve from the color and station. In this case, we had to remove the central flash because that is influenced by the secondary image. And we had to use a baseline that was determined by the model obtained previously. So this was already done after a few iterations. Um, and we used that baseline because we had no calibration images for this station. Um, again, the black line is the data, the blue is the synthetic model, and green is resi residuals. And the red line is just a reference time that we used for all of them. And I will talk, I will also talk about this one a little later. So we obtained this result for the molecular density uh, in relation to the satellite radius, uh, where this line is the surface of Triton. Uh, so we can see that the three inversions, so there's, there's six lines because we have to separate each of the three uh, light curves into ingress and egress, so the, uh, the immersion and the immersion, that's not helpful. The beginning of the event and then the ending of the event. Um, and we can see that they match well with each other. And that shows that the three stations probed basically identical atmospheric layers. Uh, I'll, we'll talk about later. Uh, what this green uh, Voyager line is. But for now, I'll just mention that they coincide. And it's just a, a hint of what's to come. And then the thin black line that we have here is the smooth model that we get from the direct approach of smoothing the profiles and getting it down to the surface. And okay, so here we have the temperature profiles for the three inversions. Um, all of the thermal profiles show a turning point here at the deepest part of them uh, where, the <coughs> where the temperature gradient becomes negative. Uh, Calern, these two, is noisier and it's not as good as the other two, but we see the same trend, the same increase, and that's all we wanted from the inversion from Calern uh, because it was noisier and there's a central flash. So even though we removed the central flash, it was still there. We still knew that we couldn't use it to match, but we knew we could use it to see if there, the shape was the same. Uh, so the, this positive gradient 
uh, is a result of the choice of initial conditions and we use it to match the temperature profiles obtained by Strobel and Zhu in 2017. And regardless of that, above around 1450 kilometers, so it's about the altitude we imposed in the initial conditions, uh, the inversion doesn't have much information from the light curves. It's already very close to the end or the, or the beginning of the event. And so the inversion doesn't have a lot of information about that point. And uh, the, I forgot the word, uh, the, the integral that goes to, starts getting a little crazy. So after that, we can't tell anything. Uh, all we want is the bottom. Um, okay, so next. Um, oh, also uh, above around 1400 kilometers, we set it to increase, the, the, we set the smoothed profile to increase linearly. Uh, to mimic the expected increase in Strobel and Zeus model as well. Okay, so now let's move on to ray tracing. So with the smoothed profile, we can do it. We can do the ray tracing now. And we fit it to all the light curves. And I have here only six of them. We used 52 out of, out of the set of 90. Uh, and we used the light curves that have a, best, the, a better signal to noise ratio. And uh, again, the black dots data, blue line is the synthetic model, uh, the smoothed model. Uh, green line is the residuals and red is the reference time. It's 23 hours and 48 minutes UT. If Okay, so with the 52 light curves, uh, we can then do a chi-square map. Um, the inner green line is the one sigma limit and the outer is the three sigma limits of the fit. And the goal of this fit is to get uh, global properties of the atmosphere. So in particular, the pressure at 1400 kilometers and the location of the shadow center with the, respect to the occultation courts without considering the central flashes again they are only tackled later and then we refeed the center into the abel inversion to refine the iteration and this provides a satisfactory fit uh, we have 54 fitted parameters almost 70,000 data points, and that gives a chi-square per degree of freedom of 85%. So now I'll talk a bit, or a lot, about the Voyager 2 radio science experiment. Um, it was done during its flyby. In this case, the occultation object was the spacecraft itself. It sent a radio signal back to Earth as it passed behind Triton. And the result that we've seen in the beginning was the surface pressure of 14 microbars and the temperature of around 40 Kelvin. However, even though it becomes very noisy above about 40 kilometers altitude, we can still extract information from the experiment and useful information. Uh, so the raw data it's shown here uh, is a radio phase that is related to two radio signals. Uh, one at 3.6 centimeters, uh, it's the X band, and the other it's 13 centimeters, and that's the S band. And um, we do this uh, calculation which uh, the delta phi is the corrected radio phase 
that corresponds to a neutral atmosphere. And this is done to remove plasma effects on, on the phase. And in again, in the raw data, that is this plot, uh, we have B1, B2, B3. This means polynomials. So they, they are three polynomials that are used to obtain the pure atmosphere phase delay. And with that, we eliminate the thermal noise and the instabilities in the frequency reference on board of the spacecraft. So in, in his original analysis in 1995, uh, um, Gurola uh, gave the B2, so it's a second order polynomial, as the preferred polynomial. And we used that one in the second plot. So in this green, uh, the green lines, uh, the wavy one is the data that has been treated already and we subtracted the B2 from it. The smoothed uh, green line is a model provided by Gurola as well. And to compare this result to ours, we generated the phase delay at 3.6 centimeters uh, that would be observed with our profiles as if they were obtained by Voyager. So if Liverpool in La Palma, the Liverpool telescope in La Palma was on board of Voyager, this is what we would have observed. Uh, so we use this equation to, uh, to get that information. And lambda is the wavelength of 3.6 centimeters. K is the molecular refractivity of molecular nitrogen. And this sigma is the column density from our best model. So we have uh, the best, our model, the smoothed model is the black line the very thin black line here. And the red uh, line is the light curves that were in inverted because there was no difference between them. So we only show one here. And so uh, to do the, the reverse, uh, we used Voyager's radio phase to retrieve the refractivity profile with this inversion. Uh, and then we can obtain the density profile using uh, that uh, equation as well. And now we can compare our results directly to Voyager. So we showed the data here minus each polynomial. Now we have all the polynomials that we should that uh, were considered, and Gurola's model is also here. Uh, the other colorful lines are our light curves inversions, and the thin is also still our model. Uh, so um, we stopped the Voyager profile uh, around 1400 kilometers because above that, it's too noisy to be reliable. and we so we can see that this profile probes altitude levels that all overlap ours so the, from here to here it overlaps our data so we can see here that that there's no difference in density between 1989 and 2017 and just as a note the polynomials, so the, the density profile of Voyager is insensitive to the choice of polynomial, which is not the case with the pressure profile. Uh, so here we integrate the weight of the atmospheric columns and that gives the pressure profile. However, since above 1400 kilometers, the data is very noisy. Uh, that tends to uh, make uh, that K 
can slew the data. So we only use a difference. So uh, for example, the difference from here to the surface or from where our stop down to the surface, the, the difference is what we used because a difference is more reliable and it doesn't include the, the noisy, the noisy uh, profile above that would yeah, disturb the bottom layers. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, the polynomials here are, are quite offsets. So B1 is very offset in relation to B2 and B3. Uh, however, uh, Gorola discarded polynomial B1 in particular because this is a linear polynomial that was determined using only 120 kilometers of the data obtained. And he considered that insufficient to estimate the drift of the instrument over the atmosphere because it didn't extrapolate from high enough altitudes uh, towards Triton's surface. Uh, on the other hand, B2 and B3 used around 700 kilometers of the data and they match rather nicely in, the, in all the profiles, the phase delay density and pressure profiles. So I'll just talk briefly about two other occultations that we have obtained. The first one on the 18th of July, uh, 1997, was a joint effort between two groups and involved four stations. Uh, here, we reanalyzed the data uh, using uh, our own approach. Uh, we used the same temperature profile as for 2017 but we vary the pressure at 1400 kilometers to fit the synthetic light curves to the data. And the other event on the 21st of May, 2008, also involved four stations, uh, but here each pair of stations is very close to each other. And that means that only two effective cords were obtained and they are also very grazing. So there is a strong correlation between the closest approach distance of, uh, of the cords to Triton's shadow center and the retrieve pressure. So as a consequence, the value of the pressure is very poorly constrained. So with those occultations, I can now show you the pressure evolution. Um, so I show you here the values of the pressure at 1400 kilometers. So it's the reference uh, pressure, uh, reference radio and uh, all occultations use this reference uh, radius. Um, we, uh, there's also an extrapolation down to the surface that uses this, uh, this cost, constant radius. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about each point. Uh, the red points are our analysis that I talked about here. And the blue ones are from other works that we don't necessarily have the data to. So the value from 95 indicates a 40% increase of pressure between 1989 and 95 but at a significance level of 1.8 sigma. The 18th of July, 1997, we have two values. So one from our group, the other from another group. Uh, the difference between them uh, comes from the use of a different template model for the temperature profile. So they are both at the 0.6 sigma level, so they're not statistically uh, significant. And if we use our value, we get a pressure increase between 1989 and July 97 at the 2.5 sigma level. So I'll skip this one for now. Uh, 2000, uh, 
2008, the, the 2008 event that provided only two brazing cords, uh, it brings no information and no conclusion can be inferred in the change of pressure because it's so unconstrained. So going back in time, uh, the 4th of November, 1997 value has a very low error bar because of the high signal to noise ratio of the light curve. It was obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope. This value gives an increase between 1989 and November 1997 at the 3.8 sigma level. However, it's not very clear how the atmosphere how the astrometry was done because this is only a two chord event. It's one from HST and one Earth based. Uh, we don't have access to this data, so we can't confirm the results using our own methods. And this is the only point with a significant increase. And so everything hinges on how the analysis was performed. And we can say with complete certainty that there was a surge in pressure during the extreme solstice based only on one point that we don't have access to. Uh, in any case, the value that we obtained in 2017 is compatible with that from Voyager. Uh, it falls well within the three sigma level. And all we can say for certain is either no surge in pressure occurred between Voyager and 2017, or if it happens, the pressure is back to its Voyager level. So now let's talk a bit about central flash analysis. Uh, among the 52 light curves, 25 showed evidence of a flux increase near the mid occultation point. And of those, we used 20 for the central flash modeling. Um, here we see the expected intensity map uh, with a bright dot near the shadow center, which is the central flash. Um, we also indicate the direction of Triton's rotation and the rotational velocity, which is 17 meters per second. So uh, even though the able able inversion method isn't valid um, for the central flash analysis because of the secondary image, the ray tracing allows for that because it includes both images in the code. Uh, the central flash allows us to gain about 12 kilometers down compared to, to the inversion method. So we ignored the central flash in the ray tracing before during the bootstrap, but now we include it, meaning we allow for any departure from the sphericity of the layer responsible for the flash. Uh, the quality of that fit is now 80%, and it's comparable to what we obtained without flashes, which was 85%. And that shows that there's no detectable departure from sphericity. And uh, so now I'll show you the again the two light curves with central flashes that I showed before. Um, at Calern, it 29 kilometers from the centrality, uh, the central flash reached its full unocculted flux. And in Constancia, which was eight eight or nine kilometers from centrality, it reached three times the unocculted flux. So there is some fluctuations in, that we can see in the residuals of the stations with central flashes. These are just two examples. Uh, they are possibly due to atmospheric waves, uh, but we don't see any global departure from the spherical model. So we don't see all of them be displaced to one side. Um, and there is also another uh, argument to support this. Uh, so we also did, um, we also took 
only the central flashes, so the center, the center of Triton's shadow. Um, uh, and we removed the ingress and the egress. And uh, anal uh, analyzing it, it coincides to within 0.1 kilometers with the shadow center of the global fit. And that offset is insignificant because the global fit has a one signal as a typical one signal error of one kilometer. Okay, so I'll just uh, say, so I'll just finish with some topics that are still ongoing or that I just didn't cover in length in this talk. So uh, we didn't see a strong oblateness in the atmosphere. Uh, methane abundance seems to have increased. However, since it's not well mixed with the nitrogen, that doesn't in necessarily impact the global pressure. The baseline for the inversion of the light curves is an open issue still. We don't add a troposphere to our temperature profile template because we are blind in that part of the atmosphere. Um, we didn't detect hazes. Uh, we didn't study the evidence for gravity waves nor analyze wind regimes. We, we, but we are not done with the data yet. So these problems uh, are still to be addressed soon. And yeah, that's it. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> so do we have uh, questions for Joanna? I can start with a quick question. So I was wondering the, um, about uh, the physics of the central flash, because it's not clear to me what it's due to. Uh, like you talked about atmospheric waves or something, but I'm not sure it's, I understand the concept of it. So can you tell us more about uh, the, the central flash and like if it's observed like for all occultations or if it's specific to your case? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, give me just a second and I actually have a slide for that. <laughs> so, and I'll share my screen again. Is that the screen that I want? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, central flashes occur uh, when the star, so this is the star and this is Triton. And they occur when they're very close to centrality and we have the primary image going in one direction and the secondary going the opposite direction. And uh, this is because of the refraction of the atmosphere and they, it causes an increase in flux. And in Triton's case, it can go to three, three and a half times the the original uh, unocculted flux. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Do we have other questions? So could you like um, derive a bit more constraints about, for instance, the composition of the atmosphere or can you just say it's pure N2 and that's it? So from the from occultations, uh, we don't derive the composition. Uh, that, uh, so we all uh, we derive uh, only the physical parameters, so the the profiles, the density profiles, and the pressure and uh, shapes and the, the shape of the atmosphere increase. Um, if there was no atmosphere, it would be the shape of the objects and uh, things like that. And like from the literature or from other observations, what do we know about uh, the composition? 
Okay, so from uh, from other observations, so for instance, uh, ALMA observations, um, they can uh, see if there's an increase in uh, methane. For for instance, that's why I mentioned the uh, methane increase. Uh, because in 2010, uh, Lelouch et al. did see an increase in methane pressure. Uh, but because, like I said, because it's not well mixed with the molecular nitrogen, that did, doesn't necessarily mean there was a, an increase there on, in global pressure. Um, so other yeah. than that, the composition, it's mainly, yes, it's 99% molecular nitrogen, under 1% methane, and there's other smaller compounds. Okay. We're done. I think I heard someone who wanted to talk. Yeah, well, can you comment about this? Non variation of pressure over time or small variation, how does it compare with uh, models? I mean, do, are we expecting during this extreme solstice a big variation of pressure from theoretical models or, or not? actually not sure if theoretical mo oh okay so um so from uh, some from uh, what was the name so from the volatile transport model uh, that was done by um uh, Bertrand et al this year uh they don't, uh, they can't uh, justify a surge in the pressure that would match uh, Voyager and our uh, 2017 uh, levels. Uh, they can do, a, if they can see an increase uh, after 2000, but it's not a very steep increase. It's not as steep as uh, that point from 97 would uh, suggest. I could actually show you the... So you, you are referring to Tongi Bertrand's? Book? Yes. Yes, I'm online actually. I can <laughs> answer that. Um, so as you may know, there is a, a polar cap of uh, nitrogen ice at the South Pole of Triton. And uh, in year 2000, it was summer solstice in the south, southern hemisphere. So we could expect a peak of surface pressure in year 2000, as it was at this time that the polar cap of nitrogen received the most of insulation. So we could also expect due to the thermal inertia of the ground that this peak is a, is a bit delayed from what we learned on Pluto, for instance. Here, our, our models do predict that. Uh, so an increase of surface pressure in the 90s, a peak of surface pressure in 2000, 2005, and then a, a slow decrease of surface pressure. And it matched pretty well the, the occultation uh, data points. Uh, so it's, it's, it's all relative because you have different occultation, different methods, and different error bars. But, uh, uh, the scenario is consistent with observation and with uh, and uh, with the latest values obtained by Joanna. So, if Joanna, you have a, you you said you have a slide and a, a figure about that. Do you want to show it? Yep. Okay. Yes, I think. So. Yes, exactly. So you so you can see that we have different scenarios with the volatile transport model. And um, we try actually to constrain the size of the southern polar cap. Uh, 
the curves in blue actually assume that the polar cap extends to the equator. So you have the entire southern hemisphere is covered by nitrogen ice in this scenario. And this produces a small peak of surface pressure in year 2005-2010. But if you assume that the southern polar cap uh, is actually less extend, extend to only 30 degrees south, which is suggested by the Voyager observation as well in 1989, then you see that you have a, a peak of surface pressure that is much higher to 20-25 microbars. So, uh, so with this uh, data point and with the model, we try to constrain the, the extent of natural denite. So ideally, we will need more uh, data points. <laughs> Hopefully in the, in the coming years, we will have another occultation that will allow us to constrain a little bit more the scenarios. Any other questions? <clears throat> so I'm sure you can plan when it's going to be the next occultation. When is it going to be? And like, are you planning like already the new observations? So actually, I was I was actually going to ask Jocelyn because I see he's here. Uh, I believe it's in 2022, the next occultation by Triton. Yeah, okay. it's on October 2022. Mm -hmm. It would be over China. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so hopefully the pandemic situation uh, goes better and we can all go there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, no more questions? If not, um, well, uh, we'll see. I'll see you uh, at the next uh, seminar. And I thank you for coming. And I thank you, Johanna, for, for your talk. Uh, thank you very much. So see you all later.